Welcome to Space News from the Electric Universe, brought to you by the Thunderbolts Project at thunderbolts.info. Scientists using the Fermi Large Area Telescope have come up empty-handed in the request to prove theories about dark matter. In 2009, two scientists detected a surprising gamma ray signal from the Milky Way Center. A theoretical astrophysicist named Dan Hooper along with several other scientists, proposed that dark matter in the form of weakly interacting massive particles, or WIMPs, may have been the source of the unexplained gamma rays. Another theoretical possibility proposed was that pulsars in our galaxy's center may have emitted the gamma ray signals. Scientists focused on dwarf galaxies, which are believed to have abundant dark matter and no pulsars. If the team found gamma ray signals emitting from the dwarf galaxies, they would have interpreted the findings as definitive proof of the so-called WIMPs. However, after a five-year search, they have come up empty-handed. Researcher Matthew Wood says of these findings, Dwarf galaxies are one of the few targets which could give us a definitive confirmation of a signal in the galactic center. Without this confirmation, the case for the dark matter interpretation of the galactic center excess is substantially weakened. Let us for a moment step backward and ask a more fundamental question. Why does institutional science remain so dogged in its pursuit to prove dark matter? This all goes back to 2009 with observations by Dan Hooper and Lisa Goodenough looking for gamma ray emissions that would support dark matter annihilation in our galactic center. The idea being that if there is dark matter, then it would be more dense in that region. And they had a fairly straightforward mathematical model to predict the region where gamma rays from annihilating dark matter would be observed. Now, in their 2009 paper, they found evidence for what they called excess gamma ray in the 1 to 3 giga electron volt range. Excess because it could not really be accounted for by other known gamma ray sources, for example, supermassive black holes or especially millisecond pulsars, or MSPs. And actually, probably one of the best competing explanations for the excess gamma rays was really millisecond pulsars, although researchers at the time recognized there's not nearly enough of a population of known millisecond pulsars to explain it. It still remained as one of the viable explanations. So this work with the dwarf galaxies began as a test, really, to distinguish between these two kinds of competing theories. Dwarf galaxies are thought to be quite rich in dark matter, but lack the population millisecond pulsars. So if we were to observe these dwarf galaxies and see the same sort of gamma ray signal with a lack of millisecond pulsars, and that would help to substantiate the idea that the excess gamma ray signal from the galactic center was due to the annihilation of dark matter. So, the upshot is the Fermi Large Area Telescope was pointed at 15 in these nearby dwarf galaxies for five years, and no corresponding gamma ray signal was found. So, this has pretty much killed um, the dark matter annihilation model for this excess gamma ray signal. Although, there are versions of the dark matter annihilation model that can be propped up somewhat if you assume the very highest possible densities of dark matter in that region. But let's get back to the original problem. Why do we even assume there's dark matter at all? And this all goes back, this could be traced back, to observations of the rotation curves of galaxies. Now the key observations were made by Vera Rubin in the 60s and 70s using a spectrograph to measure the velocity profile of spiral galaxies. She showed that most stars in the galaxy orbit at roughly the same speed. Or in other words, the galaxy had a flat rotation curve. Now, in one of the early papers, Rubin estimated that most galaxies that he had measured had about six times as much what he called dark matter versus the kind of visible matter that we can see. But it's important to understand the basic assumptions and the math behind this. The equation used to determine galactic mass is called the orbital method. Now, the orbital method is entirely based on orbital velocity as a function of mass and the gravitational constant. And there's nothing wrong with that equation. But it assumes that gravity is the only energy behind the rotational velocity that we observe. 
And it really shows how our fundamental underlying assumptions can shape how we interpret new observations, but also how we generate new hypotheses. For example, this assumption that gravity is the dominant force in the universe. It's a bit like in the time of Ptolemy. It was widely held that the Earth was the center of the cosmos, and this actually makes pretty good sense. The Earth appears solid, and the sun and stars and planets visibly revolve around us. And according to the best thinkers and mathematicians of that time, the heavenly bodies were positioned in invisible spheres of quintessence. And quintessence was something we could not observe, it did not exist on Earth, much like dark matter. So and actually, the similarities between galactic halos and shells of unobservable dark matter bears remarkable philosophical resemblance to Ptolemaic invisible spheres of quintessence. But this model of Ptolemy was actually quite intricate, and with Ptolemy's sophisticated use of epicycles and deference and equants, it was quite successful in predicting different kinds of celestial events like equinoxes and so on. But if you ask the question, what if the Earth is not the center of the cosmos, then new explanatory models emerge. Similarly, if you ask, well, what if gravity is not the dominating organizing force in the universe, new ways of looking at things can emerge as well. So what if the rotational velocity of galaxies is not dominated by gravitational forces? There's nothing mathematically wrong with the orbital method, but what if it doesn't encompass everything that might be going on? In the electric universe view, galaxy formation is modeled as the interaction of two Birkeland filaments. As recent work by Don Scott shows, the magnetic fields around Birkeland filaments are extremely efficient at concentrating surrounding matter. And the Birkeland filaments actually twist around each other naturally as they interact. So various kinds of simulations have been done with clouds of plasma trapped in two parallel magnetic Birkeland filaments. As the Birkeland filaments twist and pinch, plasma shapes are formed that have the same kinds of morphologies and flat rotation curves that we observe in galaxies. Now, this model is actually quite predictive on a number of fronts. Well, first of all, of course, the electric universe model for galaxy formation predicts that all galaxies will have relatively flat rotation curves. It's not about the amount of matter. It's about the electrical interaction of the plasma within the galaxy shape. And this explains what we observe with dwarf galaxies. It also predicts that all galaxies will have ordered and pervasive magnetic fields. And this is in fact the case. The dark matter model in no way predicts magnetic fields, whereas the electric universe model does and is even predictive of the magnitude and orientation of the magnetic fields in different shapes of galaxies. The electric universe model of galaxy formation also predicts galactic jets. And in fact, the electric model of galaxies proposed by Hannes Alvin in about 1986 predicted the existence of radio lobes caused by the double layers above and below a galactic disk. And finally, of course, the electric universe model predicts that we will observe a wide range of electromagnetic radiation, gamma rays and x-rays and UV and radio at all organizational scales independent on the electric fields and the electric current densities. So, as Don Scott says in his book, The Electric Sky, galaxies are not just a collection of stars. They are constituted mostly of plasma. Their shape and observed dynamic behavior is the result of natural electrical forces acting on that plasma. So mainstream astrophysicists will continue to run into these kinds of dark matter dead ends as long as gravity is accepted as the only organizing force in the cosmos. For continuous updates on space news from the Electric Universe, stay tuned to thunderbolts.info.